How do you measure logo churn accurately? It turns out few companies do it right. In this video, we'll introduce the idea of using control charts to detect shifts in churn very accurately. The generally accepted way to measure logo churn is to divide the number of accounts that cancel their subscriptions by the total number of subscribers at the beginning of the period. Here's an example. 25 customers come up for annual renewal in April and 3 cancel, giving a churn rate of 12%. In May, 18 out of 100 renewing customers cancel for a rate of 18%, and in June, 7 out of 50 cancel, or 14%. The manager then calculates an average for the quarter by adding up and dividing the percentages by 3, giving an annual churn rate of 14.7%. But wait a minute, this is wrong. The true churn rate is the total churns divided by the total number of customers up for renewal in the period, or 16%. This is just one example of a bad churn calculation. Some people include the number of new customers for the period, average the number of customers in a period, or even use weighted outcomes. These methods are mathematically wrong or give very misleading results. So why is accuracy important? Well, three reasons. First, a small change in logo churn makes a big difference in customer lifetime value. Reducing churn just 1%, from 10% to 9% annually, increases customer lifetime value by 11%. Second, investors pay close attention to churn. Experts say a 2% improvement in churn increases company valuations by about 20%. And third, many companies compensate employees on churn performance. That means managers must get it right. One common source of error is assuming churn rates are constant. As shown by this graph, if you start with 100 customers and have a fixed churn rate of 3% per month, you'll have 47 customers by the end of 24 months. But depending on industry and type of business, churn rates can vary with tenure. In some cases, customers cancel early in the life cycle. In other cases, it's just the opposite. Mixing churn rates at different points of the customer journey can cause substantial errors. That's why the most accurate way to measure logo churn is to take a census of all customers who have subscribed for the same period of time and calculate the cancellation rate for the entire group. Here's a simple example. The problem, of course, is that in a real business, customers are joining and leaving all the time. To make an accurate churn calculation, managers must order customer records by start date and count only those customers with the same minimum tenure. In this example, out of all customers with a tenure of at least one month, one customer out of 10 churned, or 10%. Note that the number of samples will always decrease when calculating churn over longer periods. This brings up the second major source of error, varying sample sizes. Since churn rate is a percentage, having different denominator sizes distorts results, especially when comparing sample groups. Statisticians say that if denominators vary by more than 25%, errors will be excessive. Unless you're accounting for these differences, your numbers will be off. At the end of the day, you want to know one thing. Is churn getting better? Is it getting worse? Or is it staying about the same? If you simply plot churn percentages with all their inherent errors, the signal will be very noisy. Plotting trend lines gives very misleading results. How can you tell if there's been a real shift in performance? Fortunately, there's a tool called a control chart that makes it easy. The p-chart, or proportion chart, has been used for over 90 years in manufacturing, and it works great for tracking churn. A control chart separates the signals from the noise and helps managers correctly interpret the results. There are eight steps for constructing a control chart. Let's go through them. The first step is to separate your data into homogeneous groups. For example, you may serve two completely different markets, enterprise and small businesses. Churn rates will likely be different, so separate your data into logical categories and chart them separately. The second step is to define the churn measurement interval. As you recall, churn rates may vary at different times. You'll need to choose a fixed point in time to measure churn, say at three months, six months, or a year. Third, calculate the minimum required sample size, n, per subgroup. The rule of thumb is to use at least five divided by the estimated churn rate. This will give you good measurement sensitivity for the time interval you've chosen. Note that for very small churn rates, the number of samples can become impractical, so other types of control charts might work better. Next, assemble your subgroups, designated by K. 
each subgroup must have the same number of samples n. Note that you must wait for all members of the subgroup to meet the minimum measurement interval before you plot the next data point. Step 5. Calculate percentages. That's easily done. Note once again that the number of samples is the same for each subgroup. Step 6. Plot the subgroups. Now this is very important. While the data series tracks the passage of time, the individual subgroups don't necessarily correspond to standard time periods. So rather than answer what was our churn in April, you're really answering what was our churn as of April. Most calculation errors come from forcing the data to fit into arbitrary time periods. Next, add the limits. Calculate p-bar, or the average of the data set, using between 25 and 30 subgroups. This is your baseline logo churn rate. Plot this horizontal line. Next, calculate S, the sample standard deviation. P-charts are based on the binomial distribution, so the calculation is straightforward. Finally, plot P-bar plus and minus 1, 2, and 3 standard deviations. If you come up with a negative number, just set the value to 0. Mark the zones accordingly, A, B, and C. The last step is to apply these statistical tests to the plot. If all of these tests are negative, the plot is showing only random variation. There's no assignable cause. What you see comes from minor differences in customers, sales cycles, or any number of factors. There's no signal here, just noise. You can see this from the data pattern itself. If we count the frequency of data points in a histogram, the shape resembles a standard normal distribution. This means the randomness is predictable. For example, we can be confident that two out of three future data points will fall between plus and minus one standard deviation of the mean. So how does a control chart detect a change in the results? Let's say you make improvements in your onboarding process. You notice that recent data shows things might be getting better, but how do you know for sure? Simply apply the statistical tests again. In this case, test number two becomes true when a run of nine points in a row shows up on one side of p-bar. This doesn't occur by chance, and the math proves it. You can be confident your efforts are paying off. We talked about the p-chart, but you can use other types of control charts too. These other types help when it's impractical to take large numbers of samples or when you're measuring revenue churn. So to make the most accurate logo churn measurements and to detect shifts in performance, use a control chart. You'll make better decisions along the way.